Willkommen zurück zu Until Dawn. Werte Freunde, das Grundspiel ist durch. Aber wir haben noch Bonusinhalte, die es zusammen gilt, bevor wir eine neue Episode, einen neuen, eine neue Story beginnen. Ja, da freue ich mich schon sehr drauf, einfach mal alles anders zu machen und hoffentlich noch viel Neues kennenzulernen. Das wird lustig. So, ich will gerade die Neues noch schnell wegmachen. Oh, Ihr könnt mir auch gerne Vorschläge machen, was ich in dem nächsten Durchgang definitiv mal ausprobieren soll. In der Regel mache ich das krasse Gegenteil. Vielleicht versuche ich auch, auch einfach mal alle sterben zu lassen, so schnell wie möglich. Mal gucken, was dann passiert. Dann das ist nämlich auch interessant. Dann können wir mal gucken, wer denn sterben kann und wer nicht. Weil irgendwie muss ja der Storystrang gehalten werden. Aber na gut, vielleicht auch nicht. Mal sehen. Jetzt jedenfalls gucken wir uns die Bonusinhalte an, die wir freigespielt haben. Da haben wir wahrscheinlich nicht alles. Ähm, wobei das gut aussieht, anscheinend haben wir ziemlich alles. Ja, das gucken wir uns jetzt alles an. Ich weiß nicht, wie lange das dauert. Ich mag Making-ofs etc. Ziehen wir uns jetzt rein, viel Spaß damit. Und ähm, ja, dann geht's mal los, ne? Triff die Besetzung. I am Hayden Panettiere and we are here at the studio recording until dawn. My name is Rami Malik and I play Josh. My name is Megan Martin. My name is Brett Dalton. My name is Antonella Lentini, and I played Hannah and Beth. My name is Jordan Fisher, and I play the character Matthew, Matt for short. I'm Nicole Bloom, and I play Emily in the game. My name is Noah Fleiss. I am Galadriel Steinman, and I play Ashley. So Until Dawn is the story of eight teenagers who uh, revisit this cabin in the woods about a year later after a, a really traumatic experience where I've lost two of my sisters, so coming to kind of get some closure in that respect. One of the things that Larry does really well is make these multi-layered characters, and I think for just the story in general, it's, it follows the quintessential horror film plot lines, but the characters are so unique in themselves, and I think that's very cool. Oh, I hope this was the right thing to do. What? You know, getting everyone together on the anniversary. I mean, Josh seemed really pumped about us all doing something, didn't he? Yeah, no, he definitely did. I haven't seen him so excited about something in forever. Good, good. Sam, Sam and I have uh, a few things in common, such as being huge lovers of animals. And she's a huge animal lover. She's vegan. She, um, she is a pacifist. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to go as far as saying that I'm a pacifist, but uh, she's spunky and cool. I know that she, I think, is, is made fun of a little bit by the rest of them who, who think that her morals and her beliefs in that area are a little ridiculous and they don't agree with them, but she doesn't care. It doesn't stop her from being herself and that's something that I hope I have in common with her. You know, he definitely uh, can be depressed at some times and a bit of a loner, but he, he takes some solace in one of his sister's friends, Sam, played by Hayden Penetier, and uh, invites everybody back to the same house the next year to kind of find some closure. Jessica is, oh, she has a whole lot of personality. She is definitely the sort of mean girl character that, you know, at school she, she knows she's pretty, she knows that boys like her and she's gonna use it to her advantage. He's got a big heart and you can tell that that's very evident, especially how he treats his girlfriend, Emily. And, um, you know, he's, he's kind of a meathead, but in the best way possible. She really knows what she wants, and she manages to, to get that from whomever it is, whether it be Matt or Mike, you know, she's really driven, and I can definitely relate to that. My, my character is uh, Chris, and he is uh, what society might consider the nerd of the group, um, and, and he kind of embraces it. Um, Ashley is, she's a little more serious than some of the other girls. Um, she's definitely very intelligent and, and thoughtful. She kind of looks at the whole big picture of things. She's not quite as geeky as Chris, but they connect in a lot of ways. Mike is like big guy on campus. He's uh, the class president who has some charm and has, has a brain. And I, I don't know, people seem to 
like Mike. He gets away with a lot, though. He's he can be kind of kind of jerky. The fact that he he really just kind of wants everyone to be happy. I mean, once for he's he's a people pleaser, and um, that's I can I can definitely attest to being, you know, that guy. I'm I'm always the friend that wants everybody to be happy and wants everybody to be taken care of, and that's definitely Matt. But also, like this character is just so fun. I rarely get to play the bitch, and so it was really it was really fun to do that. The spirit of things, seriously, what's wrong with you? I'm just trying to lighten the mood, Em. Don't be like that. Like what? The way you're being, you always get like this. I just think this is just the coolest thing to be a part of, and um, I just think it's gonna take the world by storm, I really do. I think this genre is the wave of the future, and I think that um, once people see the potential behind it uh, of getting to interact with the drama that you're witnessing unfold um, in such a realistic way, um, that this, this is how entertainment is going to be from now on. Ja, schade, dass das Ganze nicht ähm, deutsche Untertitel hat, aber gut, das ist ja relativ klar verständlich. Wir haben die Schauspieler kennengelernt, die äh, unsere Protagonisten verkörpert haben. Die eine da, also Sam, die ist auch relativ bekannt, meine ich. Diese, ähm, die ist, glaube ich, die Freunde von Klitschko oder so, die hat auch schon ein paar anderen Filmen mitgespielt. Ähm, na gut, schön. Hayden Patier oder wie sie hieß. Ferretier. Ja, der Rest, der hat mir persönlich nichts gesagt, wobei ich kenne ja eigentlich noch den Schauspieler von diesem, äh, dieser Psychoanalytiker, den haben sie jetzt gar nicht gezeigt. Aber na gut, vielleicht kommt der ja noch. Ja, haben halt ein bisschen ihre Charaktere beschrieben, wie sie so drauf sind. Schön. Was haben wir denn hier? Wie man eine Szene macht. Ja, das ist immer wieder... Kann jetzt sein, dass das euch nicht interessiert, ihr könnt ja wegschalten, aber ich finde das ist immer wieder interessant, sowas. Hi, this is Lee Robinson, Production Designer on Until Dawn. The production design for Until Dawn started with the great teen horror script that sets the characters in a Canadian Winter Mountain Lodge, being a contemporary setting with visual clues derived from classic films of that genre, such as Hitchcock's Psycho and Stanley Kubrick's Shining. Oh yeah, and Shining have I also think müssen zum Teil. The storyboards are vital to the production design as it allows the designer to understand the scale of the environments to be made and the detail that would be seen to create the atmosphere of a horror. This took us into concepts that took these storyboards further, visualizing the world through the color palette, the lighting, tone and the mood, and developing key locations such as the lodge, the cable car stations, the forests themselves, the wilderness. As you can see, the environments and atmospheres changed quite a bit from warm and inviting to cold and threatening. The Millionaire's Mountain Lodge was a key example. It was designed to be made from nearby stone and timber, embedding it into the landscape, with a contrasting and contemporary interior needing to be opulent and extravagant. We created dark and claustrophobic corridors with ominous and large open spaces, almost cathedral-like in size, and with huge structures to silhouette and dwarf the characters within providing a labyrinth to explore and wander. Each character was developed with a strong visual identity in mind, with contrasting colors, tones and silhouettes to identify them, each to have their own texture, pattern and shape, so that when they were lined up you could always identify them. The costume designs allowed a range of clothes that would suit them for the cold winter weather but also have an element of style and individualism so that the audience could look at them and relate, recognizing themselves within them. A lady would like to cuddle up with her man by a nice cozy fire bathed in atmospheric mood lighting. Right, it'll get plenty toasty once we're rubbing up against each other. My yeah. fire and mood lighting. Yes. Working with the lighting artists, we really brought the look and feel of the world together, and this required a thorough understanding of the visual language of teen horror. A key scene was where all the characters emerge out of the rear of the lodge chasing Hannah. A contrast is evident straight away from the exterior wilderness to the warmth of the lodge. The attention to character lighting here is through the bounce and rim lighting, accented colors and composition, creating characters that come from the dark into the light and back again with an emotional effect. Guys! There's someone outside. What the hell? Hannah! What's going on? Where's my sister going? Oh, it's fine. She just can't take a joke. It was just a prank, Han. <laughs> ich finde das einfach bewundernswert. Was sind da 
so kleinen Szenen einfach für eine Arbeit da steckt. Diese ganzen Artworks alleine. Das ist so krass. Ähm, naja, machen wir einfach mal weiter. Die Wissenschaft der Angst. Until Dawn is a game that's full of horror. And one of the things we decided to do early on was to take a scientific approach to how scary it was. So we did experiments on people and we measured their responses to the game. We've created a test area. It's as close to a home setup as we can get it. We've recruited ordinary people to play the game and we've left them to play it on their own. You're turning the light off. The only difference is it's rigged with cameras and microphones that relay the data through to the next room where people are watching them play. <coughs> Bracelet here, we use for biometric testing. It measures the player's emotional response. It's called a galvanic response sensor. It makes contact with the user's skin and it measures the electrical conductivity across their skin. It's the same principle as an old-fashioned lie detector. When you're, when you're stressed, you sweat a little, very sensitive, and picks up tiny changes if the player is feeling anxious or scared. That data is fed back to a testing team, it comes through as a graph. Na toll. Die wäre also auch runtergefallen. Hm. Schade. There's no point testing one or two people, you have to test a lot of people. Watch your step. When we have a scare that's consistently has a measurable emotional response, then we knew it was good. If it didn't have that, it goes back to the team for improvement. The data doesn't tell us what's wrong with the scare, it only tells us if it's working or not. Wait, okay, so you hear that too, right? Josh. Here what? we have a chapter relatively early in the game. Weirdly regular. Not, not. Nothing regular about it. We have to create tension and anxiety in the player so they are ready to, to receive the scare. the player time to recover, to cool down, to calm down and then start building the tension again be before we do the next scare. Hey. Uh, what? Hey. What the hell? Ooh, you just got mumped. There's two things we found. One, one is we could look at the scares, analyse if our expected scares were working effectively. Were people shrieking and covering their hands or were they getting an emotional response from it? And being scientific about it means that we strip out people's opinions about whether things are working or not. We've got data and we look at the data. If it's working, we're happy with it. Really scary. <laughs> but scared and wanting to get away. <laughs> um, I actually made, made a bit scared to play on my own, but... <laughs> In a room with the lights on, yeah, with some other people as well. Yeah, maybe. But because I'm a scaredy cat, I would play with someone in the room. <laughs> and the lights on. It was one of the scariest games I've played in a long while. Ah ja, da haben sie sich aber auch schreckhafte Personen ausgesucht anscheinend. <lacht> gut, ich habe mich auch ein paar Mal erschreckt, aber so. Na gut, äh, 1000 Seiten. Hi Larry. Hey Graham. Hi, my name is Graham Resnick. I'm a filmmaker, writer, director, sound designer, and uh, I started working with Larry Fessenden about 10, 15 years ago through my friend Ty West, who I grew up with and uh, have done a lot of sound design with on his films. And uh, he was producing Ty's films at the time, and uh, Ty introduced me to Larry. Larry produced my first feature, and we've written together on several projects. My name is Larry Fessenden. I'm a filmmaker. I, uh, I run Glass Eye Picks, which is um, an independent production company out of New York. We make indie movies, uh, a lot of scary movies as well. Um, and uh, I got a call to audition to write uh, this video game. And uh, I called my pal Graham Resnick because Graham's a gamer. And um, while I thought I could offer something to the 
idea of writing this multi-branching story, I knew that I would want Graham's expertise as a lover of uh, gameplay since I guess games were started. So and, and, and just as a lover. That's and as a lover, yes. Which <laughs> is uh, why there's so many sex jokes in the, yeah. in the game. <laughs> there was one Italian website that did say the Larry oh, Preston right. and Graham Resnick, the two lovers behind <laughs> Until Dawn. Come here. Maybe I know how to handle you too. I am definitely ready to be handled. So um, I wanted Graham by my side. Uh, yeah, and we we got the gig, and it was it's been an amazing ride. Oh hell yeah! Oh my God, she's taking her shirt off. What? Oh my God, Matt, what are you doing here? Ah. Uh. Hannah. I'm sorry, Hannah. Hannah. Hey, this all got out of hand, but... So in the game, the, the basic setup is that uh, a year prior to the game's start, all these kids had gone up to a, a ski lodge that was owned by the parents of one of the kids, uh, or a couple of the kids, and um, some of the teenagers played a prank on some of the other teenagers, and a terrible tragedy occurred when a few of them, uh, two sisters, ran out into a blizzard, and uh, were never seen from again. <laughs> So now, a year later, uh, this has kind of torn apart this group of friends. They've, uh, they've gone through some trials and tribulations in the past year. The brother of the two girls has uh, had a lot of psychological issues. And, and to kind of help him cope uh, and help them all get over it, they all return to the lodge a year later, back up on the mountain. And uh, the idea <laughs> is to, to get over it, but... Um, the healing does not begin. <laughs> Yeah. And these kids are all trying to find themselves. They've, they've, they've been through a trauma, but in general, they're just teenagers trying to figure out who they are. So they're all kind of falling into the patterns, the, the stereotypes, the, the characters they see on TV and in the movies. I think we were very interested in taking genre tropes and kind of making them uh, sort of refresh them. Dad said it'd just be us this weekend. We're familiar with how slasher movies work. Uh, you know, most people have seen some horror movies, and we have established notions and preconceptions about the roles of the players in horror movies and how they talk and how they get killed and how they have sex. And to bring you into the game that way and then subvert a lot of those expectations was kind of our, our goal. They're haunted by some incident that happened in their past, which I think you pretty much figure out that that's going to have a role in their uh, in their interaction. <laughs> yeah, so I think what was fun was we take some sort of stock characters and we try to give them some shape, but um, at least at the beginning they're recognizable in the um, in the way of groups of friends. There's, you know, the jock and the yeah. um, and the bitchy girl and the rivalries between everyone and Oh my gosh. Um, and really fun characters too. Like these it's we just had so much fun living in the minds of these characters through writing the writing the script. What do you think? Ah! Jesus! <laughs> you know, it was fun. We, I think we were looking to get that kind of banter that you yeah. see both in movies, but also that you absolutely have with friends and sort of those inside jokes. And of course, as writers and as friends ourselves, we sort of developed little tracks and we try yeah. to give the characters that kind of vibe. Ja, die Filmemacher, die sich an diesem Spiel rangetraut haben, da haben sie doch ein ganz gutes Story ähm, Script gebaut, nicht wahr? Haben sie gut gemacht. Ähm, ich überlege gerade, ja komm, einer geht noch. Die Musik. Jason Graves, and I'm the composer for Until Dawn. I 
I've been involved with Until Dawn for about a year now. Originally, I was contacted by Barney Pratt, the audio director. I think that had something to do with my lineage of horror games, and hopefully not the fact that my last name is Graves, although a lot of people seem to associate my name with scary music. One of the things that was really exciting about working with Barney and the team at Supermassive is they really wanted something unique for the music. They wanted the music to stand out and be a character on its own in the game. When I'm first starting on a new score, and it doesn't matter if it's film, television, or games. I always end up going to the main theme. Sometimes the developer or producer isn't even necessarily interested in the main theme at the beginning. I just want to do it for myself, because for me, the main theme is the identity of the game. It establishes the mood, the atmosphere, and the character of the music, and how it's going to be playing in the background. And that's what we did with Until Dawn. That was actually my demo pitch to Supermassive Games. I put a main theme together, recorded all the instruments at my studio, and sent it to them. And they liked it. We actually ended up recording that exact theme, all the instruments and everything, live here at Ocean Way probably nine months ago. And that's what we've been using in all the demos for the game. And that's the final version of the theme that is the main theme that you'll hear on the menus and in some key pieces of gameplay. I seem to have made a name for myself in horror. And there's something about scary music, I think it's maybe the lack of rules. But the biggest rule in scary music is there are no rules, so you can do anything you want, and actually, if you end up doing things that don't feel like they would work out together, they kind of clash and it ends up being even more effective for scary music. So that's what really drew me to Until Dawn, was the textures, plus writing thematic material that is interwoven with the scary textures. I haven't really done anything like that before. Usually it was just all, all tension all the time, and that's fun and it's great, but I'm actually at heart a very melodic composer. That's the kind of music I love listening to, and that's the kind of music I love writing. That's the kind of music I got to work on in Until Dawn. <laughs> Ja, die Musik war schon was Besonderes in Until Dawn. Der Part ist leider voll, werte Freunde. Wir machen noch einen weiteren Bonuspart und zwar morgen. Dann geht's weiter mit den Making-ofs. In diesem Sinne, bis denne!